afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and a warm welcome to this accelerating digital trade, part of the Davos agenda, uh, and most welcome. You know, as we start this, and I'm not going to ramble long, but as we start this, just think about it. If you'd have said to any of us, any of us, that, oh, guess what? You'll be doing these panels and it'll be, all of you will be digitally zoomed in and you'll be fine and this, that and the other. And your acceleration of e-commerce will have been used. You'd have said you were mad. Nobody in their right minds would have assumed that any of us would have been doing as much as we are digitally, even though we all knew that this was the way of the future. So today's issue, today's discussion point is as simple. The objective to explore how digital trade from e-commerce to data flow to digital payments can be a driver of inclusive growth. Now, our panel that you have here, and we will be joined uh, by, by more, our panel is par excellence. Uh, we have Al Kelly, who is with us. Al Kelly, who is the chief executive officer and chair of Visa uh, USA. Good to see you, Al. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks, Eric. Richard. Eric Guan is the founder and chief executive officer of Zoom Video Communications. Eric, it is good to see you, and we're using Thank your you. technology. So, uh, no, I just got to say, and I, uh, every time I speak to somebody from Zoom, I always feel obliged to say thank you. Thank you. You know, this technology was around for some very strange purposes. It was used before the pandemic. But the fact that you've jumped on this, I think... Uh, Hanzade Dogen Boinge, I apologize, uh, the, is the chair of Epsi Burada in Turkey. Good to see you, ma'am. Thank you. And the vice minister of trade uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Chile is with us. Rodrigo Yanez is with me. So good to see you. All right. One and all. What I don't want this to become. Let's start what I don't want. We are not here to discuss whether digital trade is good or bad or growing. It is here and it is growing. So that is our starting point. And I think we start, I'm going to start with you, Eric, because on the services side, you have railroaded yourself from a, com a, a small medium company to a mainstay of the provision of global data and services. What's been the biggest challenge? Richard, thank you so much. First of all, I'm uh, today's, uh, you know, the uh, technical support. I want to make sure today's Zoom call will be smooth, so don't worry about that. I think uh, prior to pandemic crisis, you know, we were, you know, focusing on serving a lot of enterprise or business or government customers. This pandemic crisis completely changed the way for us to serve our customers. The customers users you know, came from everywhere from almost every, more than 200 countries, including K-12 schools. The biggest challenge, you know, came from one thing, how to scale our, you know, service over the night from 10 million daily participants in December 2019 to almost 400 million daily participants. That's 40 times more usage. What we can do differently to keep delivering happiness to every user, to care about the community, to help people stay connected. That's the biggest challenge. Right. But now you've got there. We'll come back to you in a second to find out what's the challenge of staying there. Uh, Hanzade, we, everywhere we go, we are told that we are all buying more online. Now, as an e-commerce um, operation, you've obviously seen that. What is your what do you take from this? How do we grow it for inclusive growth when it's already growing? Sure. The pandemic really accelerated the e-commerce growth. I mean, in our uh, region, Turkey and the greater uh, surrounding region, before the pandemic, the e-commerce penetration was around 4 to 5%. Today, it's around 12%. So it's, you know, tripled. And at Hepsi Burada, overnight from a responsible private company, we became an almost, uh, you know, 
uh, utility company so essential for our customers and merchants that we became a lifeline and we had to scale we had to onboard thousands of employees within a matter of days and in you know it was it was challenging because while everybody was going into lockdown we were asking our employees to work over time but we stood up to the challenge it's a you know we, the first thing was the safety of employees then of course we helped our merchants we lowered our commissions we you know we we could have seen it as an opportunity for further growth or profitability but from the, our founding in our dna we've always been a purpose driven company against you know technology is about disruption but from the beginning we said we will never be about disruption we would lead the digitalization of retail industry we would lead the digitalization of payment but not disrupt it so it was a very it was in our dna and that's how we helped all of the brands you know right. the big shopping mall brands we lowered our commissions we uh, so it it was a very cooperative soul oh. company and then I just talked about the the payment side of it now to a large extent whether it's digital analog or somebody walking into a store with a credit card or a debit card you're going to be involved in it in some shape or form so al kelly visa how how do you perceive the change that's taken place well, first of all, I'd certainly echo what Hansada said that the I think we had in the last nine months, three to five years of acceleration of digital um, in many, many forms, shopping, uh, video conferencing via companies like Eric's. Um, but I, I think going back to the question you posed to us at the beginning, Richard, uh, yes, digital trading is happening and it's growing. My question is, is it happening for enough people in the world? And is it happening fast enough? I would argue that COVID-19 has exacerbated the divide between those that have and those that don't have. I think large, larger companies have done better than smaller companies. Developed countries have done better than uh, non-developed countries or emerging countries. And uh, individuals with some means have done better than people without means. And I think the question is, how how do we deal with this inequality and how can we grow thing how, how can we grow the digital world faster and include more people only about 47 percent of the people based on our numbers have access to e-commerce uh platforms i mean that that's great but that means more than half the people in the world don't and so they're not in, necessarily enjoying this uh, ability to go out and shop online and that's an excellent point for us to take to you, Minister, in, uh, in Chile. All right. So you have the responsibility. You've got all these people. You've got Eric with his Zoom and you've got uh, with, uh, with uh, e-commerce and Al with Visa. And everybody's piling in. But you want to... You want to promote this acceleration at the same time, Minister, as recognizing the exacerbation of inequality that I'll talk about. How do you do it? Well, it's a complex uh, question because it's very broad. In, in the first thing that we need to do is uh, uh, rush on uh, writing the rules that this new trade will need. So that's why we're doing efforts uh, such as the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, which was, you know, first of its kind uh, with New Zealand, uh, Singapore, and new, more recently, uh, the future uh, accession of Canada. And there is where we need to address uh, trust, uh, which is somewhat a binary concept, right? Either you trust or you don't. And uh, through transparent, effective measures, uh, we need to protect them from, you know, dealing with this uh, in, in, in when doing trade, you know, through e-commerce. So, due uh, to to to, to more actions, uh, are either uh, digitally ordered uh, or delivered, we need to reinforce also interagency cooperation between our countries and build a wider trust environment in key elements. Uh, that, uh, that's not going to happen. 
That's not going to happen. Because I, I'll come to you in a second, uh, Minister, because, you, I mean, you have governments that are prepared to attack digital um, industries in one, sage, in one country or another for domestic purposes. Therefore, never mind the trust of the companies, it's the trust of the regulators and governments that's also a question. Well, that's why it's so important to address, you know, the rule set. And that is why uh, like-minded countries like the ones that we mentioned also uh, talk about principles when we think of the Internet as an open space. Uh, and, for instance, in concrete, the prohibition to establish, you know, server localization uh, when doing, you know, digitally enabled transactions. We want and we need a cross-border flow of that we need to enable with rules. And that is why we are advancing in this uh, uh, on digital economy, uh, advancing regulation with innovation, and uh, also negotiations like the WTO one. Eric, uh, sorry, Al, you're, you're looking to join in. Yeah, so uh, I'd say there's three things that governments need to do. And I rec recognize, Richard, you're probably right that some, not all governments are gonna come along. Number one, if we try to harmonize all data privacy and protection rules globally, uh, that'll take 100 years. That, that would be a complete waste of time and not something that we should do. Secondly, we have to encourage, we have, governments have to encourage cross-border data flows through a series of trust amongst them. The reality is that everybody has, most, most governments are developing sensible privacy and data protection rules. That doesn't mean they're all the same, but if they're sound and they're principled, governments who are receiving data should respect the data flows that come in from those countries that have sound and pragmatic uh, rules. Mm -hmm. And lastly, we can't allow carve outs for our financial data localization, which is a, tempting, a, a temptation that many governments have. And I would say that uh, the vice minister's country in Chile has done a very interesting trade agreement with New Zealand and, and Singapore, where they're accepting of each other's standards and they're accepting, in fact, of industry standards, not even standards set by, by governments, then they're, they're, they're not forcing da data localization of, of information. And I, I think in many ways, that's a, a, a very, very positive step forward that Chile has taken. And I don't know whether the minister, vice minister wants to comment on it, but, uh, and that sets some ground rules, uh, set some, I should say, a framework for what's probably the best trade agreement on data in the world, which is between Singapore and Australia. But, but, but arguably, Al, for, for, for strong reasons, because the data flows on that pipe between those two are, are, are monumental um, in, in that sense. Um, I'm going to come to Eric, but Minister, do you want to comment on that particular agreement that Al was talking about? Well, yes. Um, thank you, Richard. Uh, for us, the DEPA uh, not only address traditional issues uh, on, on digital trade uh, or conventional provisions uh, such as, you know, in, in interoperability of e-signatures uh, and consumer protection, but also new rules. And these new rules are digital inclusion, AI, encryption, these kind of, 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 of issues that we need to address. Um, and also uh, talk about regulatory sandboxes, fintech, competition policy. And uh, what's important about this next generation agreement is that it's not just a chapter in an FTA. It's a comprehensive agreement uh, on digital economy that address uh, a trade, you know, that is digitally uh, done and delivered uh, while also the uh, physically delivered uh, and, and on this next generation issues, uh, which uh, right. at the end of the day, talk about this sound rule set that we need to work on and start working on. And Sunday. I would like to add something about cross-border, uh, digi like digital e-trade. When in the traditional trade, co countries have multilateral agreements linked to their national industrial policies. But when you allow a consumer to order anything he or she wants from around the world and deliver it to her doorstep in small parcel as an uh, independent nation, how do you protect consumer rights? How do you protect copyrights? How do you make sure there are no arbitrary tax advantages in digital trade? You can't. You can't. You, 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 but you need to. Okay, so we have we, we, we can't let digital trade 
have arbitrary tax advantages or regulatory advantages. It just then it's not going to be inclusive. Then it's not going to benefit the, the similar amount to each nation. It's going to be very again we're going to see this power concentration rather than making it more widely available for everybody. Okay, but we have a real live example at the moment. For example. Brexit has shown the difficulty for UK consumers to now buy things in the EU to be delivered in the UK or vice versa with the customs and regulatory and, and extra charges. Eric, we have, a pro we have a, an example with the UAE and Zoom where for naked, this is me speaking now, this is me now, for naked protectionist purposes, the, your operation is banned for, for for telephony purposes in uh, in the in parts of the uae i think richard you are so right uh, first of all i think we all agree you know digital trade digital transformation is very important however if we do not have an organization in charge of worldwide digital trade let's say and the un i'm an engineer always think about the scalability Otherwise, we need to work together with each country or countries, they need to work together with other countries. That's not a scalable. We need to have a policy very well defined. Every country, every business, every government, they got to do adopt to that, right? Otherwise, you are so right. For that problem, we will take us a lot of time, resources, we still may not get resolved, right? So that's a challenge. It's a challenge, but I'll, I, I know no one would ever call anyone on this panel naive. But is it naive to believe that there can be an overarching agreement that doesn't take 20 years to put in place so that it's obsolete before it's even in force? The speed of change is far faster than anything that Minister Yanyas can negotiate. Well, I'm a believer that markets take care of things. Uh, I think trying to negotiate a global a deal that every country is going to agree to is not going to happen. That's my opinion. Uh, and the reality is there, the pe people will start transacting where they can transact. They'll start shopping where they can shop. And the countries that open up and have good d digital trade rules are going to be con the countries who are going to get the business and they're going to give the business to their small bu business owners to be able to, to export their particular goods and other countries will start to see that they're losing out and and this might take place over a decade as well but markets will dictate this and to the uh the point that hanzadi made you know there are there are global networks like visa so if somebody buys a good uh in malaysia they live in in france and they buy a good in malaysia and they and they buy it on their visa card we're going to stand behind them that's what we do we we, we that's part of our our job is a network. So there, the reality is we can help protect the, protect the consumers. So I'm a, I, I think that the free markets will take care of themselves. The countries that will have good trade oh. policies will, will do better than those that don't. Right. So um, Abba Schubert has just written in the chat room. Uh, Ms. Dogenboiner is showing us the goal. Mr. Yanis is giving us the path. And Messrs. Kelly and Juan are giving us the tools, one foot in front of the other. Good point. So what's the next step? How do we let's as I remember, I said, we're not discussing whether it's going to happen. We know it's going to happen. What is in your view? Uh, we'll start with you, Minister. What is the next incremental step that needs to be taken? Well, I think uh, the scale of this for SMEs and, and the regular people, what we've seen in this pandemic is that uh, what was expected to, to happen in years happened within weeks. And so we, we've got a huge opportunity uh, to democratize trade, but also a huge challenge with this, you know, uh, uh, yes, what has to happen? Divide. What has to happen? Well, you have the rules. Now we need to start working and implementing these rules. And this is why this agreement that already exists is signed. Uh, uh, it's there, and that is why it's so aligned with the needs of the market and why it has it created so much traction. Uh, and that is why it's the first of its kind. So now we need to get our hands down on work and making you know, things flourish and happen. Okay, so Eric, 
What do you need to happen next? Zoom is ubiquitous. I, I look, I, I always make the joke. We will all go to our grave with somebody saying. <laughs> I mean, it is the phrase that we sort of. But so what do you need now to take Zoom to the next level? Regulatory, tax wise, technology wise. Give me the thing you need. I think just focus on, focus on technology innovation. As you mentioned, right, as you, you know, demonstrated, right, we are on mute. If you can talk, you know, we can leverage the AI. We still can understand what, what you are talking about, right? After this meeting is over, automatically generate a meeting summary, right? Or me and Richard, we did not see each other for a long time. You know, even after we can stay connected with Zoom, I cannot give you a hug, right? And all those innovations will happen in the next several years. The innovation can truly drive productivity to make the Zoom experience better than face-to-face -face meeting. We are very excited in the next several years for technology right. innovation. And Andrade, the excitement is there. You set us the goal. I'm not sure I... Do you want rules of the road or do you want restrictions on others? I want... I mean... I don't want restrictions on the others. What I want is what do my world view is that I'm a tech enthusiast. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm a technology entrepreneur. I believe in globalization. I believe in free trade and inter international trade. But whenever we talk about from a point of a developing country, it should not always be seen as protectionism or anti-globalization. Because I want to carry my merchants to cross-border uh, trade as well. But the next thing, I believe, companies has to take more responsibility, like Visa or like Hepsi Burada. No one can sell fake products on my platform, even though there are, you know, 100 million products. We, t we make sure we are behind what we sell. So I believe in the next era, we have to see corporations, we can't only talk about free trade, no regulations, and technology is going to change everything. And no, you know, yes, technology will change everything. But if you want technology to change everything for better, to be more inclusive, then we need to find a balance between corporations, government, and citizens. I now, ask, it's, you know, it's oh, technology, citizens, sure. governments. That Are needs we to seeing the rampant, and I know it's a slightly different type, but it's germane, Al. Are we seeing, let's take what we're seeing at the moment with GameStop. Don't worry, I'm not going to, Dental, I'm not going to ask you what you think of GameStop or anything like that. But are we seeing at the moment digital, um, a digital wild west? that needs to be reined in? I don't know that I, I want to draw a conclusion for what's happened in the last 48 hours. Uh, you know, the, the reality is that w sometimes there are going to be bad actors. Sometimes things aren't going to go perfectly. You know, unfortunately, planes crash, and we still want to have people fly around, around the world, and, and hopefully we learn from every one of those things video conferencing goes down we don't want to we certainly want to keep promoting video conferencing the re, the reality is that you asked me what i want to see i want to go back to my inequality point we need more people around the world connected to broadband number one because too many people are outside the financial mainstream we whether we're individuals or we're we're running a big company like i am or or eric is or Hanzata is we, we all should want more broadband access. And then this is about public-private partnership. There are roles that Eric's firm can play, my firm can play, Hanzadi's firm can play, working with governments. And again, I believe in free markets. And the reality is that there, there will be governments that will want to have a good public-private partnership. We will develop good uh, uh, trade policy. They will develop good trade policies. They will work with private sector companies to make sure that mm -hmm. uh, consumer is properly protected. And again, I think, for instance, Visa has a big role in that in terms of how we act around the world. We operate in every country in the world, but the five the U.S. has sanctions against. And we, we, every one of those countries is important to us and every one of the customers is important to us, regardless of where they are in the world. Finally, to, to you, Minister, 
do you sometimes feel that you're yeah. behind whatever curve there is and that whatever domestic issue or policy you want or you feel is necessary, the reality is in individual countries don't matter as much in a global world where e-commerce flows on services and on goods um, will 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 naturally find its level course. It does. It, 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 that's what's uh, uh, the, the risk that we can that they're facing. And uh, what the problem is that the speed, uh, even you know, with the, the DEPA, I'm sorry to, to <laughs> sort of promote this agreement so much, but. We talk about AI, cybersecurity. These might be concepts that, you know, might be outdated pretty soon. So, uh, and we need to keep advancing uh, very fast. And the, the reality is that the main risk is at, at, the, at the scale of uh, e-commerce. With SMEs and with the little, right, uh, you know, that we, we, at the end of the day, throw them out. Uh, and then uh, we face a, a trust meltdown because they don't have the tools, because they don't have the rules, the trust to operate in markets and make their lives easier. And that's the, the, the problem that, that I think we face. And, uh, and, and, and in countries like, like mine and the developing world, this is uh, even, you know, uh, more severe because we, we might be left out of this revolution. And uh, we, I think, are doing our job in, in setting the rule book. But this is something that it's extremely, extremely fast. And the pandemic has only, you know, made it, uh, make it faster.